This video is about the Tasmo, an excursion ship that ran between Detroit and Port Huron. This is actually the first historical video I ever made back in 2012, but it was never included uh, in the series, uh, my Port Huron series on the city, because of the length of it. It's about 35 minutes long, and YouTube at the time was only taking 15 minutes, so it had to be posted on a different platform. Later on, I did post it on YouTube. But uh, since I'm winding down on my series, I thought it'd be beneficial for everyone that I include it. It's important because before the automobile and before the interurban that ran between Detroit and Port Huron, that was the most efficient way of transportation getting from Detroit here. And it wasn't just for excursions. It wasn't for joy rides necessarily, but it was for a lot of different things, you know, just transportation, uh, one point to the other, for the United States mail to get from one point to another, and also carrying freight. It wasn't as fast as the train. It had more stops to make, but it could go places where the train couldn't, and it was much more enjoyable. But the Tashmu was best known for its luxury accommodations for excursions from Detroit to Port Huron. That's the closest you ever come to going back in a time machine and actually getting aboard the Taj Mu and taking that trip. You'll see all the stops, the resorts, Taj Mu Park, and everything they would have seen back then when they took the trip. So enjoy. The year was 1900. William McKinley was the President of the United States. Theodore Roosevelt was his Vice President. The 1800s had seen many innovations, including the electric light. Most commercial businesses now had electricity, and many of the homes now were getting it. The same is true with telephones. The automobiles were another wonderful invention, but in 1900 only the wealthy could afford them. It was approximately eight years away from being mass produced by Henry Ford so that the average man could afford them. And of course the roads weren't really designed yet for automobile travel. Detroit, Michigan, like most major cities, had all these innovations in effect, including the electric streetcar. But the one thing they didn't have was air conditioning. Heat was unbearable in the big cities, and they tried to cool off in any way that they could. At night, sometimes people would sleep on their roofs, or sometimes they would sleep even on the fire escape in order to escape the heat. Four years earlier, in 1896, Almost 1,500 people died in New York City alone. The heat was unbearable. So it wasn't unusual for people to take the weekends to be able to get out of the heat and enjoy the cool breeze that came off the Detroit River at Belle Isle. In Belle Isle, of course, you could maybe dip your toes in the cool water, a place to have fun with the children. It was accessed by a wooden bridge but really most people took the ferry because they enjoyed the breeze coming off the water as they went across the river. But the ultimate escape from the heat was to take an excursion boat that ran from Detroit to Port Huron, or in some cases from Detroit to Toledo. The queen of the excursion boats was called the City of Erie a large and fast steamer, but her days of queen were coming to an end. In 1900, the White Star Line had a new queen waiting to be crowned. White Star Commission noted marine architect Frank Kirby to design their new flagship and his design certainly did not disappoint. The name of this new flagship would be the Taj Mu. 
What is the meaning of the word Tashmu? The answer is no one knows for certain. Many local residents say it means sweet water. Others suggest resting place. In a newspaper article dated August 1898 before the steamer was built, claims the word means happy thoughts. But all agree that it comes from an American native word. The ship was actually built in 1899. However, it wasn't actually ready for the excursions until 1900. Other work had to be done to it, as well as the shakedown crews, to make sure everything was fitted properly and running properly. The new steamer was built at this yard in Wyandotte, Michigan. The city became known as an important center for metal shipbuilding following the Civil War. Following the launch of the new steamer, the hull was towed up to Detroit to receive her engines, cabins, and all the finished work required to make a first-class steamer. And first-class it was. No expense was spared, as evidenced by this next series of pictures. Here's the mahogany paneled dining room on the main deck aft looking forward. Note the specially crafted marbleized columns. Along with private parlors, there was a richly furnished private dining room at the stern of the main deck. It was here that President Theodore Roosevelt would be served lunch on September 22, 1902, during his trip on the steamer. And of course, the galley that supplied all the dining rooms. Refreshments could be obtained at this snack bar. The room was finished in oak and located on the main deck just aft of the engine room which can be seen through the open window at the left. And there was also a beer garden on the lower deck. For comfort and privacy, there were eight finely appointed private pilers, such as this one, located four to each side on the promenade deck. Located on the promenade deck, which is just above the main deck, the main salon seen in this view included elaborate Wilton carpeting, richly upholstered lounge furniture, and a grand piano. No detail to the comfort of the passengers was spared, and note the fine brass spittoons discreetly placed at the base of the columns. This is the large dance floor, with the center stage being where the band would play. This is one of my favorite rooms, mainly because of the view. This is the smoking room. It was located on the very top deck and was finished in chestnut stained olive green. Seating included finished wooden benches below the windows as well as comfortable wicker chairs. Brass spittoons, of course, were also included. Two trial runs were taken for the steamer. The first on May 14, 1900, was held on Lake St. Clair to fine tune the engines and small mechanical details. The second, the owner's acceptance trial, shown here on May 27th, was conducted on the Detroit River. All went well, and the Taj Mahal was officially turned over to its owners. The Taj Mahal was now ready to take its place in history as White Star's newest flagship. And like anything new, it had to be advertised. Constructed in 1896, the Majestic Building was Detroit's first skyscraper. The structure boasted 14 stories and stood just over 223 feet tall. For comparison, the White Star Line did not hesitate mentioning that its new flagship was 109 feet longer than the famed building was tall and seemingly had more windows. While accounts vary, most agree that the steamer had at least 600 windows. After acceptance by its owners, the Taj Mahal made a grand tour to several ports on Lake Erie. In this photograph, the steamer is leaving Toledo and heading back to Detroit. And of course, bragging rights were involved as well. The Taj Mahal claimed it was the fastest boat of its time and the city of Erie claimed the same. And so it became inevitable there'd be a race between the two. 
and so it was. The race was a little less than a hundred miles. They were neck and neck most of the way, but the wheelsman of the Tajmu was unfamiliar with compass sightings when they were out of sight of land, and so he was off course somewhat. And they also had a problem with one of their condensers. But once they got these problems corrected, the Tajmu was gaining fast on the city of Erie. And at the very end, they missed winning by about 30 yards. The city of Erie had won, yet it was a hollow victory. Few doubted that on a straightaway, the Tajmu was the faster boat. On the spot, the White Star Line offered to post $10,000 for a return match. It was in vain. Never again would the owners of the city of Erie be involved in a race with the Tajmu. The cash mill was built specifically for the Detroit to Port Huron run. And the way transportation was back in 1900, between Detroit and all points north, there was very little going except the steam engine. And so the cash mill acted very similar to a Greyhound bus. She had passengers, she had mail, she had freight, and she would make 20 stops before she ever got to Port Huron. Thirteen of these stops would be in St. Clair Flats at Harsons Island. Most of these stops would be resorts that were close to the water where people could get away for the weekend or if they had the money for the week. Some folks had cottages there that Tajma would drop them off at the dock nearest their cottage. But the most popular stop of all in St. Clair Flats was the Tajmu Park. The park was the property of the White Star Line. It was a very desirable picnic resort with guarded bathing grounds, free band, 60-acre grove, athletic field, fine bathing beach, 2,000-person pavilion, only two and a half hours from Detroit. For only two dollars for the day, one may mingle freely with bankers and merchants and millionaires, as well as with the common people. Every Tajmu excursion included a band on board. This appears to be the band on dock practicing. This is William Finzel's band. From the beginning of the White Star Incorporation, Finzel would provide musicians for all the line steamers and park pavilions. In this 1902 photograph, some of the men are resting at the park between sets or they're waiting for the steamer. This is the agreement here between White Star Line and the Finzo Band. It says they get $141 a week for the eight men combined, and that is in 1904. The remarks say if any of the men are not satisfactory to our general manager, they are to be replaced by ones who are. I always enjoy looking at pictures like this of the individuals aboard the boat, wondering what each person, what their story is, what their history is, why are they there today, and could they be a relative of yours or mine?
Some look like they're having fun, some look like they're bored, some look deep in conversation. But I think they all anticipated a wonderful day. So I like looking at the docks to see what's there. Here we have a horse and buggy that has made a delivery. I'm not sure what's in these canisters, either something for liquid consumption or something for fuel consumption. And then over here we have the coal that is supplied to the steamers. The Tash move alone took 27 tons of coal for the day. Here the Tash mill gets underway. Her whistles sounded and the Tashman pulls away from the White Star Line dock at the foot of Grizzle Street on Detroit's busy waterfront. Note that Captain Burton S. Baker, who served as master on the Tashmo from 1900 until 1922, is on the port side bridge at the pilot house. It appears that the steamer is loaded to capacity with passengers looking forward to a pleasant day's outing to the flats to Tashmoo Park and to points north, including their final destination, Port Turin. In this postcard here, you can see the Tashmoo heading away from the Detroit waterfront and heading toward Lake St. Clair and the flats. This is a map of the stops that the Tashmoo made as it went into St. Clair and then through the channel all those resorts listed there along with Tashmoo Park but also stopped then at Elginac and Marine City, St. Clair, Snake Island, Sarnia and last but not least Port Huron. Once I got into Lake St. Clair the passengers could see where it got its nickname the White Flyer. It was going almost 22 miles an hour but it also had another unique nickname it was called the glass hack for all the glass windows that it had in it. This view of the U.S. Ship Canal shows one of the twin lighthouses on the north bank. This is the canal that took the Tashmo into the flats where it made the 13 stops. Here the Tashmo is coming into his first stop, the Old Club. It used to be a fishing and hunting club, but now it's become, by 1900, a social and boating club. The entire building was sheathed in shingles. The second stop was a hotel Merview with special weekly rates of $25. They also had regular launch service to any part of the flats for 25 cents. Free dancing on the largest dance floor on the flats. The largest clubhouse ever built at the Flats was the third stop for the Tashmoo in the Flats, the Rushmere Hotel. It was constructed in 1884 for the Detroit Fishing and Hunting Association and could accommodate 150 guests. Sadly, in 1908, while guests were enjoying a lunch and picnic and lawn games, a kitchen grease fire burned down this beautiful building. In this picture, we have the Taj Mahal pulling away from the hotel. The next stop was the Star Island House with its large roomy verandas, sailboats, rowboats, steam and gasoline launches, 
It also had a large basin in the center of the grounds containing specimens of fish and wild waterfowl. It also had lawn tennis and croquet grounds, bird shooting, billiards, bowling and dancing, a 150 room hotel with a 500 capacity dining room for only $2 a day. Here we have a group of folks sitting out on the hotel lawn enjoying the afternoon. The hotel had a large dock, as large if not larger than the Taj Mahal herself. Here we see a woman and a daughter perhaps walking along the dock, waiting for someone or possibly just looking at the passengers on the Taj Mahal. The next stop was the Marshland Club. Built as a private hunting and fishing club, the Marshland Club had 38 rooms plus a large dining and dancing area. The next stop was the Riverside Hotel. This hotel had a pleasant location at a convenient bend in the river that allowed the patron while sitting on the veranda to view the passing boats from the moment they entered the canal four miles away to the time they disappeared at the Maple Leaf, a distance of eight miles. The eighth stop was Joe Bedore's hotel. Joe Bedore was proprietor and host extraordinaire. His hotel became the most famous of all the waterside road houses between Lake Erie and Lake Huron. $1.50 a day, meals 50 cents, dancing pavilion, marvelous meals and stories, 30 rooms and slot machines. The ninth stop was the Muir House. The Muir House provided no bar facilities. It was known as the hotel where single women were to fill at home. The next stop was the Maple Leaf. The Maple Leaf was a dock used by the White Star Line to drop off some of the 100,000 cottagers who came to Harrison's Island every summer in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The cottagers came from all kinds of backgrounds which were reflected in the type of cottage they had. Some of the cottages were quite modest, others were more elaborate. And for the very wealthy, the cottages were very nice indeed, such as this Morgan Cottage. Can you imagine sitting out on the veranda and looking out on the channel with this view here? Of course, the next stop was one that was anticipated by so many of the passengers on the Taj Mahal, and that was Taj Mahal Park. This was a 60-acre park. Visitors would picnic and play baseball, enjoy the swings and merry-go-round, dance at the pavilion, ride bicycles on a cinder track, and at the water's edge, enjoy swimming and boating. Here we see the passengers disembarking the steamer. As they came off the steamer, they could actually take their parcels and check them in uh, at the parcel room just beyond the dock, so they wouldn't have to lug around their packages all day. Here we have the pavilion, which served a dual purpose. It was used for dancing, but it was also used for the picnics. The folks could get out of the sun and have their picnics underneath the roof. Here's a group enjoying their picnic. Not exactly how we would dress for a picnic today. Here we have a family walking down this shady lane enjoying their day and perhaps later go to this bathhouse and change into their bathing suits to enjoy the water. A fun day at Tajmu Park. The last stop in the flats was the Grand Point Hotel. This is a hotel that had a 300 foot long veranda situated on the highest point of Harsons Island. It had parlors and lounges, smoking rooms, pool and billiard rooms, bowling alleys, dance hall, and was also surrounded by a 10 acre grove. A resident physician was in attendance. They also had long distance telephone, post office, and telegraph. 
As the steamer pulls away from the hotel, notice the turbulence of the water from the two paddle wheels as the steamer heads out into the river, heading for the mainland. First stop on the mainland is Algonac. Algonac was a popular vacation community. It was also the center of the pleasure boat industry and home of the famous Chris Craft Company. Started in 1884 by Christopher Columbus Smith and his brother Henry. Here you can see the people waiting for the Tajmu to dock. Next it was off to Marine City. Notice the light boats on the Tajmu. There was only a total of eight, and the Tajmu held over 3,000 people. It wasn't until after the sinking of the Titanic that there was a law mandatory for the number of light boats that it must have. The Tajman stopped at the Union Street Dock in Marine City, located about where the Bell River flows into the St. Clair River. Marine City was a major shipbuilding center during the latter part of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Over 250 wooden boats were built here in the city's several shipyards. The city was also home to many of the lake's professional sailors. The next stop was the Oakland Hotel in St. Clair, Michigan, and this advertisement is referred to as St. Clair Springs, also advertising that they were open during the winter. It reads in part like this, the Oakland Hotel and Bathhouse at St. Clair Springs, Michigan, 50 miles north from Detroit on the beautiful St. Clair River, 300 rooms, steam heated, elevators, spacious corridors, covered verandas, the finest hotel accommodations, the best equipped bathhouse, physicians thoroughly skilled in balneology and electrotherapy. In this rare photo we see the inside of the Oakland, the lobby, and here we see the passengers departing the hotel to board the Tajmu. The next stop was Stag Island, which was located on the Canadian side of the river. Stag Island was a popular summer resort by 1905 accommodations, included a fine hotel, the Griffin Hotel, with an elegant dining room and 21 guest cottages. It also had the casino that was been pictured here. In addition to the White Star Line, the steamer Hiawatha made six trips daily to the island from Sarnia, along with the Omar Bradley from Port Erin, which is shown in this picture. As the steamer left Stag Island, they were getting very close to their final destination, which was Port Erin. And if the passengers would look out the port side of the steamer, they'd be able to see Black River and at the foot of Black River, the lumber mill. And perhaps they'd see a ferry coming out of Black River crossing to Sarnia, or perhaps it would be crossing right in front of them as they made the switch. But before it could reach its final destination of Fort Turin, there was one more stop it had to make, and that was in Sarnia, Ontario. And as the Taj move left Sarnia, they just had to go across the river to the White Star Dock in Port Huron. And there I imagine the passengers could see the folks waiting for them on the dock. I always thought the White Star Dock in Port Huron would be the most exciting place to be. Especially in 1900, when the Taj Mahal was making its first runs through the different communities. And for the people that couldn't afford or couldn't be on the Taj Mahal or the other excursion liners, they'd be able to stand on the dock and get close to it and be able to see it close up. I imagine that the folks that made the trip specifically to go from Detroit to Port Huron were excited too to see what this little town of Port Huron had to offer. It wasn't as large as Detroit, of course, but it was the largest of all the communities that they stopped at along the way. It didn't have a waterfront hotel like 
the St. Clair and many of the Flats hotels did, but it did have a wonderful hotel in the Harrington Hotel. In 1900, the Harrington Hotel would have only been four years old, a relatively new hotel. It had 150 comfortable rooms, $1.50 to $2.25 with lavatory and toilet. $2.50 to $4 if you included the bath. And not only did it have a wonderful dining room, but it also had a coffee shop and tap room. Here we see the hotel lobby. Like the picture says, you'll like Fort Huron. And I think most folks did. Here's one of the views in Fort Huron looking south on Huron Avenue. Then on the other side of the Military Street Bridge, we had Military Street looking north, looking down from the Harrington Hotel. And of course, Fort Huron had one of the finest and most elegant courthouses in the state of Michigan. The next stop for the Tash Move was Niagara Falls. Whoops, just kidding. In the days before Photoshop, this was considered what they called a trick postcard. And this one here is a more conventional postcard, and they both could have been purchased in Fort here in Michigan. No, Niagara Falls wasn't their destination. Their destination now was to go back home to Detroit, making the stops along the way. By the time they got back, it would be dark. I imagine it would cut quite an impressive figure looking from the shoreline to see the Taj going by with its lights on, perhaps the moon shining on it. There were two dramatic events that involved the Taj The first was on December 8, 1927. That was the day the Taj in the worst storm on the river in years, disappeared without a soul on board. A 60 mile an hour gale was blowing, driving snow before it. And during the night, the temperature dropped 40 degrees to 8 above. The Tajma was moored at Winter Anchorage, made secure by 14 heavy steel cables. The watchman said, She's gone. Gone right up the river. The watchman remained at his post while the storm mounted. Then the cables started snapping, he said. They went one after the other like they were a grocery string. The watchman heard a crash muffled by the wind moments after the Tajma broke loose. What the Tajma hit, they learned later, was the very promise shown in this picture here. All three deckhands leaped to the dock after the impact. They were getting up steam for the ferry's first morning run across the river. There's only one thing that can stop that fool boat, he said, the Belle Isle Bridge. Visibility was near zero. But long before the searchers sighted the Tajma, they could hear the anguish banging of the ship against the concrete abutment. And then there she was, listing heavily to port, her sides gashed. Two tugs arrived, and after a struggle to get lines aboard, they pulled the Tajma away from the bridge. Still, she wasn't subdued. The Tajma snapped her lines and once again plunged toward the bridge. She was only 10 yards from the bridge when the tugs got lined on her once more. And this time she followed them to the Detroit Shipbuilding Company dock, where she was built. The second tragic event took place June 18, 1936, on a return trip from Sugar Island to Detroit. Sugar Island was an amusement park similar to Taj Moo Park, only it was south rather than north of Detroit. Tashman was chartered for a moonlight ride that evening by the Pals Club, a Hamtramck, Michigan social group. River traffic delayed the Tashman's return from her day trip, one of the cut rate Friday excursions to Port Huron sponsored by the Detroit newspaper. She left the dock in Detroit at 9.20 p.m. She reached Sugar Island at 10.35 p.m. and started on the cruise homeward at 11.20. As she came out of Sugar Island Channel, a shock was felt throughout the ship. Passengers were told that there was engine trouble. But the orchestra played on, and the dancing was never more lively. 
But in the engine room, it was different. The Tajmu had struck a submerged rock and the wound was mortal. As water poured in through a hole in the hull faster than the pumps could handle it, the engine room crew stoked the boiler fire in a swirling, waist-deep flood of water. The captain called for full speed ahead. Ten minutes after the shock, the Tajmu docked at a coal company wharf above Amherst on the Canadian side. Only after passengers and crews were safely ashore did the grand old steamer sink to the bottom in 18 feet of water. The Tajmu's days of glory were over. July 1936, this announcement was published in newspapers across southeastern Michigan. Service aboard the beautiful SS Tajmu to the flats, Harson Island, Tajmu Park and Port Erin would be discontinued for the 1936 season. No reason given. When the steamer Tajmu was scrapped, her pilot house was saved and rebuilt as a private cottage near Chatham, Ontario. Sadly, this last piece of the famous excursion steamer was destroyed by fire on June 10, 1951. Tajmu sailed the waterways for 36 years. She was a classy and elegant ship built for fun and for comfort. It had quite a legacy, evident by the fact that 100 years later, we're still talking about her. I wish I could have taken an excursion on the Tajmu, calling from Detroit to the Flats, to Port Huron, with all those stops in between. But in a way, I feel like I have with this video. And I hope you have too.